Welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex, which connects you with the world's top independent management consultants, and I'm your host, Will Bachman. I'm very excited to be here today with Kazuki Kuzuru Salifoska, a good friend of mine and someone who's going to talk to us about the fashion industry and uh, some particular roles in it. Kazuki, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, Kazuki, uh, you can put it in your words better than mine. Tell us a little bit about your firm and what role you play in the in the whole process of getting uh, fashion made. Sure. Uh, the company I founded with my buddy Donnie Jansen is called Kedic Fashion Workshop, and we call ourselves uh, sort of a fashion apparel production uh, consultant firm and the part of the fashion design or manufacturing process we touch is what we call the designing product development and pre-production process and we do a little bit of production process support as well but um, those are usually done by the factories and our role is to sort of facilitate the factories and troubleshoot with them and maybe part of a QA process setup kind of thing. Okay. So, so mul multiple of those terms, I don't understand. So, <laughs> so which is fine, right? Because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm new to it. So goal here is to teach me. So let's, maybe you could walk me through the entire, you know, set of processes of getting a item of apparel designed from the very beginning concept to when it's actually on, on the shelf somewhere. Uh, walk me through those different steps, and then along the way, you can highlight, you know, where you get involved. But just like walk me from the very beginning. Sure. So let's say you, Mister Buckman, wants to start your own fashion label, women's or men's, and you come to us with like you have this great idea, like you think you you make a great great splash in the fashion industry, and you want us to help you make it come true. So the very first step is what we call a design process, which could involve a sourcing process of like looking for fabrics, looking for trends that applies to your target audience and looking for styles and silhouette that, you know, sometimes you already have that in your head that we sort of coax it out of you to put it in a form where other people can understand what you want to produce. And that would be, you know, when you see like on the TV shows or movies, you see a fashion designer like sitting at a cafe and making these beautiful sketches. That is that part of that process where we draw up quick sketches based on the fabrics that we're sourcing with the client and uh, incorporating the um, trends and colors and sort of texture and the feel of that per, um, collection that you want to create. So that is the beginning of the design process. And then you could break that it down into like more minute details, but we're not going to do that because we're going to be talking for hours. Okay. And once sort of you cement um, design ideas in rough sketches and illustrations, then, uh, and lined up the fabrications and color schemes you want to work with, then we go into product development phase of the design process, which is, the goal is to have a showroom or salesperson ready samples. So once you have the sketches, you work out the constructions and details and fabrics, and then you engage a pattern maker and have the pattern maker make the patterns. And then, then you engage a seamstress or a sewer or sample hand who would then cut and sew the garment, the sample. And you, once these samples are done, you go over it with a client. And a lot of times what your client, Mr. Beckman, thought would be a great idea on when he was in his head or when he was a drawing, um, it might not really work in real life as a garment. And then you might say, oh, I, I want this line moved or I don't like this silhouette. Let's change it a little bit. So there's a lot of brainstorming that happens once this first set of samples are made. And once the revisions are decided, then we go back to the pattern maker, direct the pattern maker to change the patterns, change the patterns, make another sample with the sample hand, 
And hopefully that is what we call a salesman sample or um, proto sample or showroom sample. And once that's those are ready, that's when a lot of times Will Buckman would start to approach buyers with these samples. And okay. yeah. Okay. So that that sounds like an amazing step to go from this sort of so you, you just have this illustration of what the what the garment's gonna look like. And then the pattern maker has to turn that into actual measurements and so forth that sounds like an incredible art and skill right there um, yeah and and a lot of people think it's it uh, a lot of people don't know how much i'm like i made it sound kind of short but this could take months and months of work and um, back in the day when i started as a baby fashion designer uh, the fashion designer had to do everything they had to sketch they had to source they had to create the inspiration board and talk to the pattern maker and create sort of um, what now we call technical package. But now that job has split into two, the designers and technical designers. So I currently do both designer and technical designer roles, mostly because I started in the fashion industry when there is no such job as technical designer, but most companies have two separate department, tech design department and design department. And they will be working in tandem and talking to people who source fabric or pattern maker or seamstress to really make sure that whatever the initial designer, Mr. Will Buckman had in his head into sort of reality. And that, that yeah, that could take a long time. And some people like to um, bring in what some of the clients we work with like to bring in the garments out of their closet or they would just buy some sort of garment online or at the store and bring it in and tell us to just um, copy it or rub it off. Mm -hmm. But um, I personally consider that a theft. So I always try to um, persuade them into tweaking and changing something to make it their own. Mm -hmm. And so far we've been successful. <laughs> So the, the technical design piece would be what like so the design piece is coming up with the concept, sourcing the fabric and and the sketch, and then the technical design is taking that sketch and making it into the, the pattern. Uh, to making it into translating, creating a tool to translate that beautiful um, vision into um, a more realistic technical form so the pattern maker can understand what you're saying. Okay, great. So uh, designers would do these beautiful sketches of like a lady walking a dog in this beautiful dress or something and mm -hmm. hand it to the technical designer. And technical designer would take that and turn it into what we call a flat sketch, which sort of looks like a blueprint of a clothing. No flair. It's just accurate drawing of each garment with all the seams in place and all the top stitching in place. And when that turns into, uh, when it gets included into a technical package, we call it tech packs, then uh, information about like the height of the hem or the distance between the seam or edge and the top stitching, um, or even like stitch per inch for top stitching sometimes gets specified and all that information gets uh, added or created by the technical designer. Okay. So, okay. So then I interrupted you. So we talked about, you would get the kind of showroom sample ready to go and then, and, and that, that they can actually take to buyers. And then what are the, what are the follow on steps? So, um, usually in a traditional sense, um, buyers would somehow react and start placing orders. And then once the order information comes into the designer, Mr. Backman, then Mr. Bakuman would edit your the, your collection. So maybe you started out with like 30 samples and showed it to the buyers. And maybe you have out of 30, 25 some styles that got sales against them, but five of them have maybe zero or very few orders against them. Then you would decide to edit those out and you will make the whole collection a little tighter and a little smaller because the, um, purpose of that is to make sure that, that you don't end up with a massive amount of inventory. 
because even if you have an order against a style for like maybe 20 pieces, traditional factories are not going to produce 20, 30, 50 pieces of style. They would want at least 300 um, pieces per style. Mm -hmm. So once that decision is done, then and salesperson would hand it over to the pre-production and production department. Pr production people, person, production manager, production person would then start placing order for bulk material. So the fabrics, the trims, that make sure the labels are in place, make sure, make sure the hangers are ordered, um, because those turnaround times are usually 45 days mm. up. So production team starts running with that information, placing orders, and then pre-production team, their job, including the technical designer, is now to make sure that this beautiful sample that was made to be used as a sales tool will now be um, turned into a fit sample to make sure that the, each style, when it's produced, will fit a real human properly mm. and in a flattering kind of way while reflecting the original idea the original designer had. And tell me about that part, about the, the, the fit design, because my understanding is that that's a role that, that your firm plays in yeah, that is like our um, bread and butter in our service providing for the companies, uh, the brands. Um, we make sure that when things are produced, they fit properly. And for that, we um, each company or brand has a fit model. And these models' job is to maintain their body shape and body measurement within half an inch at any time. Wow. So these are amazing women who <laughs> ex exercise regularly, but not too much. <laughs> and they can go out on a cruise and have fun with their friends, but come back on Monday, their body measurement is still within half an inch of what they're supposed to be. Because they're like, you know, the easiest thing to do is to use a mannequin who doesn't eat or breathe, but you want humans to try on these garments and give you the feedback of like, oh, it's digging a little bit too much at the armhole, or I can't lift the arm arm without picking up the garment too much, or I think I look like a football player and that's not the look that's flattering on me. So we um, help you, Mr. Buckman, choose um, the fit model that works for your aesthetic vision and your customer base. And once that's done, um, we start fitting these garments, the, these samples we have on hand. And hopefully those samples were made in the fit model size, but a lot of high-end brands don't do that. They make the showroom samples like size zero or two, but they want fit model to be at like size four or six because you want the fit model to be in the middle of your sizing range. So if you're offering the women's sizing from double zero to say 12, you kind of want that in the middle, which is like about size four or six, because what that means is that you're making the pattern in that fit model's body. So it looks great on her. And once that pattern is finalized, you're taking that pattern and mathematically grading up and down from there. So if you're offering from double zero to 12 and your fit model is size two, her body is too close to the smaller range of the size offering that you have. And if you think about a, a lady who's size two in a lazy size eight or 10, it's not that their body measurement is different, but the way they carry their weight is different mm -hmm. like the larger size women have more projection whereas size someone who's like size two don't have much of a, a curves right they're sort of like my mother used to call me tree trunk <laughs> because I had, I had no breast no hips no waist nothing so if you make a clothes that looks good on the young kazuki and it might look good on me but if i grade it up someone who is three sizes larger than me it's not going to look good on them because they would have breasts and they would have hips. So even if it doesn't like, it's not, you're not straining the fabric, it's just not flattering on you. Mm -hmm. So you want to have the fit model that's in the middle of the size range. We'll help you do that. 
And once that model is identified, we start fitting these samples on them and just make sure that it's comfortable, she can move, and it looks good on her that balance between front panel and back panel of the dress or shirt or pant is balanced so it's not tipping one way or the other. And after that's done, we do that a couple of times, revising the pattern, making the sample, making sure it looks good. And one of the samples, at least one of them, should be made by the factory that's going to produce the garments. So then if we have to adjust the pattern to their tendency of maybe stretching out the neckline or maybe stretching out or shrinking the armhole, we will adjust the patterns to compensate for their um, tendency. Hmm. Once all that is done, patterns are approved, and then we help the client, Mr. Buckman, grade up and down the pattern. And then for that, each company has what they call grading rules. So it so the rate of increasing and decreasing on each point of measure of the garment is usually developed uniquely to each company. There are like certain basic rules, like usually for numeric sizing, which is double zero zero two four six eight for for women wear, body circumference at the bust, waist, and hip are usually one inch. Like that is pretty much universal. But how you grade up and down on like the torso length or sleeve length, those things can vary from client and brand and companies. So we sort of work with them to see what their preferences are, are which brand they kind of want to reference. And we poke around other brands um, grading rules by just studying their garments and tell them like Calvin Klein looks like this is what they do. So maybe, you know, you're in the right path if that's what you're going for, or just give them what we believe to be the most logical grading rule that we have in our system and tell them, this is what we recommend. You know, if you want to do this, that's what we can do. Then we take all that information and send it to um, a vendor that we closely work with that grades the pattern. And they have the entire system set up where we send a pattern in digital form and they grade up and down the pattern to the size uh, scale that we give them based on the grading rule we send them and then we send that information to the factory along with the finalized tech back and what we call cutters must that accompanies each pattern and hopefully production team has done a good job and all the bulk goods are waiting for for us at the factory and production begins so the factory doesn't order the supplies the brand will order the supplies, have it shipped to the factory. Yeah, there are factories that, that we call them ver vertical factories that have access to all that, like have access to the fabric mills, have access to trimmings. Um, there are companies that do that. And I know, I'm sure you know the company Lee and Fong mm -hmm. out of Hong Kong. They, um, they, most, they can do vertical operations like that where you don't have to worry about anything. They take care of everything. But they, their commissions are pretty high mm. when you work with companies like that. And um, a lot of times you don't have the control over how things fit and things. So then when something goes wrong, it's hard for you to troubleshoot because all you can do is to say, this doesn't look right, fix it. And you can't sort of intelligently argue with them about exactly how to fix it. Mm. And when you're relying on uh, factory or, or third party overseas to take care of your fit, you know, fitting is happening outside of your vision most of the time, then you don't know exactly how they're fitting. And when they're overseas, their fit models they find that in China or India are probably not the, you know, the type of fit model you would like to be using if you had access. Mm. Now, Am I correct? I think you've told me before that you have your firm has particular expertise in doing all of the fit, you know, fitting and uh, scaling for for some of the plus sizes that help, help. Yeah. So what we do, um, big chunk of our business is to make sure that to help brands, the existing brands, going into a plus size market, because um, we have an experience. Our team that um, 
that we have now. We used to be uh, working at the company called Guinea Bee, and they were one of the first plus size subscription women's clothing company. And when they started it, there wasn't enough supply of plus size women's wear that were, you know, nice and fashionable. So they decided to ha um, hire a bunch of us who who knew how to produce plus size garments. So they would have in-house private label operation. So uh, when that's where I met my business partner, Donnie, and uh, that's where um, I met our pattern makers. Well, actually, I, I actually hired the pattern maker to go come with, work with us. So, um, and because Guinea Bee was not a fashion company, they're more of a tech startup company. So their approach to apparel manufacturing was very um, data oriented which is sort of unheard of in a fashion industry where everyone to this day mostly make decisions with their gut feelings. So it was really interesting to learn to actually like be the nerd that I am and make decisions based on data and so customer feedback in a way that was sort of organized. So once that um, work was done, we uh, decided to just continue with what we were doing because at Guinea Bee, part of the job we had was to convince the existing straight size brands to produce plus size clothing for Guinea Bee. And they didn't know how to do it. So we would take their styles and um, convert them into plus size patterns because you can't grade up from like size six pattern all the way up to size 24. Mm. If you think about size six lady and size 18 ladies, the same problem I mentioned earlier bet about between size two and size 10 ladies, the difference in projection in the body and the shape of the body, even if the measurements are the same, is just really um, different. So you have to make a separate pattern for plus size range of the garment, even if the style is supposedly the same. And so our job was to sort of educate the brands and convince them that this has to be done in order for the clothes to fit and then execute them for them by um, taking over the pre-production process. Yeah. So, so, this that, is, so this is really interesting. So some brands that will have what you call uh, the straight sizes only go up to, you know, what sort of percent of the population do they leave out? It's not, it's not, uh, they're, they're leaving out 72% of the population. Wait, say that again? 72% <laughs> of the population. That is amazing. So Yeah, the last number was size 14 and up. The U.S. population of women who are size 14 and up, which is considered the quote-unquote plus size range, is 72% of the entire U.S. population. That is extraordinary. And, so yeah, to think that these brands are – you know, intentionally like designing the clothes that only fit 30% of the population is kind of mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it like economically makes zero sense. And like, I didn't even think about that, right? When I was designing for brands, it didn't occur to me. Like no one thought to look at these numbers until a few years ago. And even now, after these numbers are being tossed around in the apparel industry, there are still a lot of brands who are ignoring that fact. And especially now where, where you know, financial situation and economy is a little up in the air, it baffles us at our company that it, it takes a lot of conversation for us to convince people to go into plus size. Yeah. Can you share the stories of any brands that have, you know, added plus sizes and what the impact was? Yeah, so um, one of our, our uh, main clients, uh, they're called Veronica Beard, and they are well-established um, high-end American designer brands. They have a very clear aesthetic vision, and um, they're, they're found, they were founded by two women who are opinionated, smart, and very creative. And... Um, they approached us. I think they Googled 
or something. And then it, it was a pretty early point in our firm. And they were, we were surprised that Veronica Beard is contacting us through like our contact list on our website. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, wow, it's working. So then, um, and by the time they found us, they were ready to go into plus size and they wanted to do it right. And they, they didn't, they understood that going into plus size was almost like creating a separate collection, which is the conversation we have to have with a lot of uh, potential clients where this isn't like you get to spend a couple thousand dollars and it's done. This is as if you're starting a whole new collection from scratch. You are going to cultivate the new clientele. They're out there, but if you don't let them know you're doing it, they're not going to come find you. Mm -hmm. And you can't be, you know, embarrassed about catering to fat women. But Veronica Beard had already discussed all these things amongst themselves and they were just ready to go. And they knew the amount of work it would take to do it. They had the marketing team lined up. They had styles sort of already chosen. They wanted us to help them finalize the styles because not every style work for um, plus size body range, sort of like not everyone can wear the, all the, the dresses that are out there, even in a straight sizing. So they came in with the right um, point of view and right attitude where they knew they didn't know um, how to do it. And they sort of trusted us to like sort of guide them. And then we, we also just made sure that they understood that um, we're human, we do make mistakes, but we learn all the time. And as we learn new things, we will be sharing that information with all our clients. So they've been doing this for about two years now, and they've had fashion shows that incorporated plus size uh, runway models, and they ha their marketing team is always pushing and reminding the, um, everyone that they are including the, the larger end of the ladies. And um, I think, I believe they're doing well. Their sales are, as we were told, because we're not inside, um, their, their sales figures are really good in plus size range, and they are continuing with that at least through um, next few seasons as they plan the seasons ahead in this uncertain time yeah. that everyone's freaking out over. That's a great story. Um, yeah. Let's, let's pivot to kind of the today. So what do you see from your perspective of – What's going on with the coronavirus pandemic? How is that affecting, you know, um, the fashion industry? What sorts of conversations are you having? Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing. So um, a lot of our clients, we had one client who put the plus size production program on hold for upcoming seasons, um, although they had already started developing it. So in the middle of the process we sort of we sort of stopped and um because everyone is afraid to spend their resources up front because they don't know how the marketplace looks like when we come out of this and we don't frankly we don't even know when we are truly going to come out of this situation so um there there seems to be two distinct groups of our clients one group is like we're going to hunker down. We're going to just cut off and put all the unnecessary or non-essential programs on hold to survive this storm. And there's another wing of our clients who seem to be generally more of a smaller indie brands who have been doing plus size. And a lot of them are sort of like, I call them the activist designers. Some of them are plus size like models themselves. or so some of them might not be plus side themselves, but they're very driven by their ideology about equality and just everything, including fashion. Mm -hmm. And those those clients are almost gun ho about making sure that they will proceed with what we're doing now together. So when we do come out of this, the plus size women are not going to be left with like no selection in fashion industry. They want to make sure that there will be supply waiting for them when we all come out. Yeah. All right. And I think partly because they're smaller, so they're not bogged down with like financial responsibilities. 
with investors and things. And there is one factory that we have a close relationship with who can do um, produce to order. So there is no minimum working with them. They're more expensive per unit to produce garments. And a lot of our smaller clients are working with that factory or factories that have really smaller minimum. So I think they're lighter on their feet and their activist spirit is still driving to do what they consider the right thing to do. Fantastic. Well, Kazuki, where can people find your firm online? If you want to share a website, if you want to share Twitter, where, where can yeah, they find um, you? Uh, our website is keticworkshop.com. And I think from there, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Our We have an Instagram person who put posts, who shares a lot of interesting things or what our clients are posting. We share a lot of these things. Fantastic. So, well, we will include those links in the show notes. Thank you. Kazuki, thank you so much for joining. No, thank you, Well, And stay safe. <laughs> okay, you too. <laughs> okay. Bye.